Hello and welcome back to Gary's Garage and after last week's frustration with this radiator, this week we are not going to be doing anything with the cooling system. So last time I finished off all of the modifications to the cooling system and pressure tested everything. Unfortunately, the radiator has a hole in the core just down here. I must have nicked it with the grinder or melted it with the TIG welder and it's leaking. I left you because I was going to go and ponder what I was going to do with this. I have had a couple of suggestions and had a look around and there are things like some low temperature soldering and also uh, I could use some kind of epoxy resin to fix this hole but that would only ever really be as far as I'm concerned a temporary thing. I'm always going to have that niggling doubt in the back of my mind that is that repair going to hold. So what I have done is I have bought a replacement radiator which arrived yesterday. So it's going to stay safely in its box until probably next episode. And what I'm going to do is, because I've shown a lot of what I'm doing to the radiator and the cooling system on camera already, and I'm basically going to replicate it, so I will just off camera just plod on just a little bit at a time and get the new radiator working and with the same mods as this radiator. But for today, what I want to do is just try to tick off a few of the little things that are on my list behind me. So this episode will be a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So let's crack on with the first thing. The first thing I'm gonna do is sort out the cover that goes over the alternator. So I already have one. However, I have trimmed this out just a little bit more in order to make it easier to get the alternator in and out. So what I'm going to do, rather than remake this whole thing, is just add on a small extra bit to the top of this that will pick up up here, and then I can get that re-secured. new bit stitched on and all ground back and I wasn't expecting a seamless join but it's not too bad so I'm quite happy with that so that will go on there and then that just needs to be trimmed and then I'm gonna put some rivet nuts in rather than using the tech screws I'm actually going to stay at the front of the car and the next thing I'm going to sort out are the air filters. So I have this rubber tube which is an original uh, rear turbo feed from the VR4 and that goes through there and onto the front of the turbo and that brings the air filter down here behind the front panel and that allows it to pick up nice cool air that's not being affected by the heat coming from the engine bay. So the filter here on the driver's side has a temperature sensor in it. That allows me to see the temperature of the air coming in through the filter. I've got another one between the turbos and the charge cooler, and then another one between the charge cooler and the inlet manifold. And what that allows me to do is log on the ECU those three temperatures, and I can see how effective my charge cooler is really. And that's how I knew previously that I needed to do something a little bit better with the water flow through it. And because this filter is sitting here, I've also got this shield, which goes round it and stops it getting too many splashes of water from the front wheels because there's no 
arch liner here. So I need to reattach all this lot together, get it on to this hose and then get the bracket to attach it nice and securely onto the inner panel here. So that's both air filters now properly attached. Let's move on to the next thing. Okay, so that's the air filters done and it makes sense to start working further back on the car. And the next thing is that I need to get this vacuum feed coming off of the manifold through into the body. And there's also a few holes in the bulkhead where there were wiring looms and various other things coming through. So it makes sense also to plug them up now so that when I do finally take it out for a drive, I'm not going to get wet. So I think what I'm going to do is run this up here and go through this hole here. And I found a rubber grommet with a hole in the middle. So that can go in that hole. I can poke the hose through and then it's available for me behind the dash. And I'll then find some other rubber grommets and fill in all the rest of the holes. So I'm going to move into the boot now and try to sort out a couple of the niggling things that are still left over here. First of which is this vent coming off the top of the tank. So this is needed so that the tank doesn't draw a vacuum and also if the fuel temperature increases it doesn't expand and have too much pressure in it. So at the moment this hose is just looped and blocked off here in the boot to try to stop some of the smells staying inside the car. So what I need to do is I'm going to use this concoction of fittings here. We have a bulkhead fitting that will go through the floor, a joiner which will then go into this one-way valve. So this should allow the tank to vent but if for some reason I manage to roll the car onto its side or its roof then a ball bearing inside here will seal it up and stop the fuel from coming out and then we've got an AN fitting to go on there and a hose will come up onto here so that should be a nice simple thing to knock off the list. Right, that's the fuel tank vent done. And as you will have seen, I also put some riv nuts on these uh, strap mounts, which just brings that profile down a little bit cleaner. So when I decide to trim the boot, it will, I've got sort of five millimeters more space, which is gonna be very useful in a boot of such a small size. So while I'm back here, the final thing I really want to do over here at the moment is just sort out this indicator on this side. Um, if you're watching before, when I got the wiring up and running, you'll remember that this one was a little bit dodgy and I'd have to wriggle the wire. So let's find out where the wire or connectors are damaged and fix them. Okay, it appears to be on this joint here, on the uh, 12 volt into the indicator. The ground seems okay. So, yeah, just this. It's actually out the bulb itself. Actually the bulb holder. So let's take the lens off and give that a bit of a clean up as well then. That'll be what's causing it then, so let's clean that off. Clean up the bulb holder and put it back. So just a little bit of corrosion in there seems to be the problem. This did sit outside for a while with dodgy foam seals, so it's quite likely that the bulb holder just um, got a bit rusty before I put it all back together a few years ago. But all of these foams and seals for the lenses and the 
casting to the body are all available from the Ford Anglia Owners Club. So nice and easy to get hold of new foams and replace them if they're weeping. So that seems to be hopefully that resolved now. So I'll stick it back in place and we can move on to the next thing. Right, that's a couple of jobs done at the front of the car and also at the back of the car. And there's a big bunch of jobs in the middle of the car that need doing, most of which are tidying up wiring. And as you know, I don't really like doing the wiring, but it was my decision to put such a stupid modern engine into an old car. And unfortunately, with that comes the responsibility of wiring. So let's figure out what's still left to do and try to just knock these jobs off one at a time. Okay, so first bit of wiring I'm gonna look at is the cruise control switches. And the way that this works is it's a simple two wire switch. And as you press each of the various buttons, it changes the resistance within the switch. So in order to wire this up, we need the five volt sensor feed coming from the ECU, a ground, and also the signal wire that comes out of here. And I've just said it's two wire, but I need three different things. So what we do is we create what's called a potential divider. And we have the five volt feed coming from the ECU. And that gets bridged across onto the signal wire. And then as we pull this, the signal wire and the ground get differing resistances on the, between the signal wire and the ground. And there's that fixed resistance between the five volt and the signal wire and that gives a differing voltage output on the, on the output, which then is read by the ECU. So we get zero volts on one switch position, about 1.2 on another, 1.6 volts on another, 2.8 on another, 3.6 on another position, for example. So it's a nice, easy way of getting lots of different signals through just one wire, which is great for the ECU. And the great thing is the Link ECU supports either a voltage-based cruise control switches or by wiring up multiple switches to digital inputs. Thankfully, the switches I've got are resistance-based, so that makes it nice and easy and only one wire into the ECU. So I need to solder in a resistor onto some wire, get it all hooked up to the connection that's under the steering column, and then that's the cruise control switch is sorted. Over here we have the statuses of the cruise control. So I'm not touching anything at the moment. Okay, I'm now pressing the on button. And we'll see that the cruise on switch lights up. And our status switch is between off and enabled. And I'm now cancel, which is pulling the stalk towards me and set uh, resume or increase speed is up on the stick and again that's working and down is set so they are all working quite nicely right plugging in the ecu then and seeing stuff on the screen reminded me that i still haven't wired up this temperature sensor on the front which is the pre-turbo temperature sensor or basically ambient air temperature. So I've got a plug and some connectors so let's very quickly get this done and then that will be another fault code that the ECU isn't registering. Okay after having a bit of a tidy up over this side there's a lot less over this side than I thought there was. I've got the reverse light switch signal that comes from the gearbox that needs to be spliced into these two cables here. And over here is a little bundle of grounds that need a ring tag on it and attached up. And then hanging around here at the dash, we've got the hazard light switch, the heated front screen switch, fuel level sender, and the power for the uh, heater blower. And up here is the diagnostic port that go, and there's a cable that goes off there to the ETAX unit and that will plug into the ECU. So it's not really too much over here. So I'll just uh, continue on and uh, get a couple more things crossed off the list.
eagle-eyed among you will have realised a lot earlier than I did that I've just been soldering these joints and I've been trying to use crimps on some of these internal body joints instead. So I've got a mixture now of crimps and solder, but as I said before, soldering isn't all that bad. This isn't going to be under huge vibrations. And this circuit at the moment is only the reversing light, which is not a legal requirement for a vehicle of this age in the UK. So if for some reason this circuit fails, it's not the end of the world. <sighs> I was too busy too, and eager to just get on with it. But there we go. But anyway, that is now the reverse light all done and it's on a connect plug. So if I do need to take out this bit of loom, then I can do without having to take it all the way back to the gearbox. Okay, I think that'll do for a bit more wiring for the moment. So I'm gonna turn my attention again to the engine bay. And over here on the inlet manifold is a outlet and a bit of pipe. And that did go off to the back of the car and that was my vacuum feed for the uh, brake servos that were in the boot. Now, I've no longer got those because I've replaced the pedal box and master cylinders with new ones, which means that I shouldn't need them. So that means that I've got this outlet on the side of the manifold that is a potential place to have an air leak. So that's not great. So what I'm gonna do is pull off the inlet manifold and then I'm going to take this barb out and weld up that hole. And while I'm doing it, I've got a little present from a friend. Well, it's more of a loan at the moment, unless I just kind of forget to give them back to him. But uh, one of my very good friends has sent me through a set of 1000cc fuel injectors and all the various adapters that I need to make them fit. So the injectors that are in this are 390cc and as a rough guide, very rough, on petrol, on a six cylinder engine, for every cc of injector that you've got, you can get about one horsepower. So my limit is about 390 horsepower that would be if the injectors were running probably at 100%. For safety, you really want to run the injectors at about 80%. So take 20% off that, and we've got sort of around the 340, 350 mark, which is more than plenty for this car. However, I don't know exactly all of the parameters for the, for the injectors to program the ECU really accurately for the fueling. So that means that potentially my fuel table has got built into it some of the injector characteristics rather than it being purely just the, the airflow that is required and then the fueling stuff is done separately in the modelled mode on the Link ECU. So my theory is by swapping out to these known 1000cc injectors with very good, very well documented data that should eliminate any injector issues from my fuel tune. And then I can go and get it tuned up with these injectors in, and I'm definitely gonna have plenty of headroom on the injectors. I'm not gonna run out of fuel injector, and I can push as much power as possible out of it. And then I can swap back to the original injectors, and without changing the fuel table, but just changing the injector dynamics, I can then hopefully tune in the injectors and things like the dead time, which is how long it takes after the signal to turn them on and open them, how, how long it actually takes to open them and start getting fuel flowing and the actual fuel flow rate. So yeah, swap out known good injectors, tune it nicely, swap back to original injectors, reconfigure a couple of parameters to get it running nicely and then I've got a good set of injector data that I can share with the Club VR4 community on 
the Link ECU with standard injectors, which will hopefully help out a couple of people. But I might just, you know, forget to give these back to my friend, but we'll see. Nah, I'm not that kind of person. So while I've got this off, I can get to the fuel rail and we'll swap in these injectors. So with those injectors swapped out and everything back as it was a little while ago, I want to say a big thank you to my friend Jason for lending me these injectors and I promise that I'll give them back to you. Maybe? No, I will. You can hold me to it, everybody who's watching. Um, but that is about all I'm going to do in this episode. Um, a few things have cropped up in real life and it means that I haven't been able to spend as much time here in the garage. but the way things go and I managed to just cross a few little jobs off the list which is quite nice a change of pace sometimes rather than just delving straight into the really big things and of course I've still got that radiator that I need to redo all of the modifications to that I won't bore you with um, so you might see some progress on that next time or that might be a little bit later um, but again with a change of pace this has been about a year's worth of content on YouTube and I didn't really think that I'd be able to keep up the pace when I first started, but I have. Um, so I want to say a huge thank you to everybody who has been watching, who is still watching now, especially the 200 or so people who have hit the subscribe button and the four people who have currently joined me on Patreon and the one person who's given me a donation off outside by PayPal. So huge thank you to all of those people. It is really appreciated. And if you're not subscribed and you like what I'm doing, why not hit that little subscribe button? And if you really like what I'm doing, your support on Patreon would be really appreciated. So as I said, that's all I've got planned for today. So thank you very much again for watching and I'll catch you next time on Gary's Garage. Bye.